everybody, and welcome to GP Bullhound's uh, second annual consumer subscription software webinar. Thrilled you guys are all here. Um, so this is really exciting. We've got some fantastic panelists uh, that I'll introduce here in just a few minutes. But just to first kick off, um, we're going to do just a quick plug on GP Bullhound and what we're doing for the consumer subscription software ecosystem. Um, so as many of you know, uh, we're, we're an investment bank founded over 20 years ago, headquartered out of London, but with offices around uh, nine countries around the globe, uh, including two in the US, New York and San Francisco. Uh, I currently sit in San Francisco and head up our consumer subscription software practice, uh, which is growing by leaps and bounds. And so we've been, we started this practice in 2018 and have been very active in the sector <clears throat> since then. So closing quite a few number of M&A transactions as well as capital raises for our CSS clients. And so Franz, if I can take over the screen share, I'll just show, show a few slides real quickly on what, what GP Bilhan is working on in the space. Let's see, so just as you guys can see here, what we've got is, I'm just gonna switch the view. Um, so we've been publishing uh, CSS reports now. We're publishing our third report this year. Uh, it'll come out actually today, uh, available free on our website. Also through email, you're welcome to download it or view the web version. Uh, in addition, we do uh, we try to take as much uh, work as we can to be active and in the community. So we've been writing articles for TechCrunch uh, and doing some podcasts. We'll actually be doing one for Revenue Cat, uh, which is one of my favorite businesses supporting the CSS ecosystem uh, later today. And then just a few examples of transactions we've worked on. Uh, the first one that I really loved and really introduced me to the sector was the sale of all trails to Spectrum Equity. We recently uh, invested in Discord, which is a consumer subscription communication app, uh, completed the sale of Pink Bike, which is a mountain biking business to outside, and then helped Lingoda raise uh, capital from Summit Partners. And then as you can see, we have quite a few existing clients in the space. And then we're also making investments off the GP Bullhound balance sheet um, directly into CSS businesses like Revolut, Bosu, and our most recent investment, which was Whoop. And then Final two things from us, um, we're trying to continue to be supportive of the ecosystem. So we've launched a survey uh, in the latest report. So for any uh, founders or investors that wanna have an idea of how they stack up against other CSS businesses, we're asking you to contribute your data anonymously. Anyone who contributes their data will then quickly, uh, will get a report then about the entire ecosystem's data from all the contrib contributors. So this will be kept private. This isn't gonna be published. So it's a great chance for you to, to kind of see how you measure up. So if you're curious on your conversion rate, your CAC, your organic growth, this is a great chance to, to learn a little bit more about how others are performing. And then final note, we'll talk about this a lot with our panelists, which is just um, the CSS flywheel. And this is how we think about evaluating all our, our uh, consumer subscription software clients, understanding what actually drives to that key piece of recurring revenues, either premium content, data, user acquisition, how they monetize and price. And then if you're going after a niche user base or a large TAM, and then ultimately churn and retention. So, which is which is the key piece of keeping that recurring revenue. So with that, I'll stop the, the shameless plug and really excited to introduce our panelists here. Um, so if Taylor, Tripp and Jakob all wanna come back on video, uh, what I'd love to do is just quickly kick off with an introduction to who you are and a little bit about your company. And so I'll start with Taylor. Thanks, Eric. Hello, everyone. I'm Taylor Neiman, the co-founder and CEO of Toucan. Toucan is a way for you to learn a new language just as you go about your day. Imagine you're on New York Times, Google, Twitter, Reddit. We swap out keywords, phrases, and sentences to whatever language you're trying to learn and really immersing you in that at jointoucan.com. And we've raised $7.5 million to date. Great. Yeah, Trip. how about, do you want to go next? Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Trip Adler. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Scribd. Scribd is a subscription service for reading. We bring everything you want to read into one place. We can read at whatever device you like, and we sync across your devices and give you personalized recommendations. So the more, more you read, the, the more personalized it gets. Um, we think of ourselves as the, uh, one, of the, one of the biggest libraries in the world. We have over 180 million pieces of content, all for one uh, flat monthly price. And um, excited to be here today talking about uh, subscriptions. Yeah, and Trip, just a personal note, I've been a subscriber to Reflectly, or not Reflectly, excuse me, to Scribd for the better part of three years uh, and really enjoying some of that content. So thanks for what you guys are building. And then last awesome. but not least, it. yeah, last but not least, uh, Jakob, would you like to go next and talk about yourself and Reflectly? 
Sure. Uh, hello, guys. My name is Jacob, and I'm the founder and CEO of uh, Reflectly. Um, it's the, the largest journal lab in the world at this point, launched back in 2017, started selling um, subscriptions back in late 2018, started 2019. Um, today, we've also been exploring a couple of other things within consumer subscription. It's a field that we really like and, and believe in, um, and looking forward to, um, to sharing my knowledge uh, the, the best way I can today. Great. Well, welcome, everybody, and, and thanks for being here. I know you guys have extremely busy schedules. So I think just for, for everyone watching, we're going to walk through a few, a few questions, just a little Q&A with the panelists. Um, as you note at the bottom, you, are, you will be able to submit questions um, to the panelists or myself, and we'll try to, we'll try to cover those in the last 10 minutes of the, the webinar. So uh, for now, let's, let's kick off. So for, first question, I'm sure a lot of people on this, on this webinar are very focused on some of the more recent Apple rulings. Um, obviously, there's been a few cracks in the Apple walled garden. And so while the Apple and Google Play stores are fantastic ecosystems to distribute content and products, they do, they do take a hefty charge for that. And so uh, maybe I'll just direct the first uh, question to Trip. Um, any quick thoughts on, on the Epic and Apple rulings that have, that have come out in the recent uh, couple of days? Yeah, I mean, um, I've always been um, kind of surprised that Apple takes such a, lar a large cut. I mean, it just seems like, uh, for, from my opinion, I would think they would, would want to do more to encourage an ecosystem of, of, of apps so I've always been surprised by that. I mean, that said, they're a really smart company. I'm sure there's there's a, a reason they, they they do it the way they do it. Um, but yeah, I, I think in in this case, if they are going to be sharing a larger percentage of the revenue with um, with the app makers, uh, I think that's going to be good for the ecosystem overall. And I mean, that'll be good for us. It'll be allow us to to get a larger uh, larger percentage of the revenue and increase our margin, and and it will encourage the number of times we drive through Apple. Um, I and mean, we've actually always. Uh, just, just we we've always driven quite a few times through 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 iOS. Um, you know, we figure that there it's another source of signups, and even if they're lower margin signups, we generally are just happy to get those signups. Um, uh, but I think this will just make those signups for getting better margin, and that's going to be a good a good thing for us. Yep. No, I think it's a, it's a very balanced take. Uh, Jakob, anything from your end? Uh, I would agree a lot of things he's saying. I think you know, for us, it's definitely coming up from the from the early days. You know, having having no money or anything. You know, Apple's been, of course, an extreme help. It, it access gives access to a ton of people, and and I think you know, it's their store. They should probably enable them to do whatever they want with their own store, right? I think the problem could be that potentially we would like to go together with some other that's in our own store, right? I think so, so as long as they open up for for everyone, I think it's fine. But you know, they, they on their own. Now, now the pressure seems to be on, right? So, so probably that we're going to see some changes. But I have to say, Apple did help us a lot in the early days, like getting it from from zero to one, essentially. Um, so, so we do also owe them a lot, of course. But yeah, there there is a balance to everything. Yeah, it's a pretty. If you step back and think about the iOS platform, it's a pretty amazing way to reach consumers in almost every country around the world instantaneously. Um, so there, there's definitely a pro and a con to it. Um, maybe just, I don't want to spend a ton of time on COVID, um, but obviously that's, it's been a really interesting time to reach consumers digitally. And so a lot of our clients have seen tremendous booms or sometimes bust due to COVID. So maybe a question for Taylor, you know, you, you've recently, um, you know, Toucan's not 10 years old, so you've kind of been raised during COVID a little bit, but would love to hear just how, you know, COVID maybe impacted your business and, you know, potentially helped you kind of think through your next chapter. Yes, so we did start pre-COVID, although we're only about two years old or so, um, mm -hmm. and we were already starting to scale. And the beauty of Toucan is that we meet people where they already are. So our growth to date, we think would have happened pre with or without COVID and the pandemic happening, but the entire ecosystem that we are in saw a huge boom of a lot of these language learning apps, people finally having time to use them, which has been great for Toucan because rising tides um, for us, which we saw with Duolingo IPO, which is amazing. I'm sure Babel and Boozoo are right behind them too, um, but really exciting for the overall ecosystem, which then thus benefits Toucan. But we're already engaging with users over five hours every single day which is wild to think about. Yeah, that's phenomenal engagement. Trip, maybe uh, any thoughts from your end just on uh, how Scribd navigated COVID? Yeah, I mean, COVID uh, changed the, the, the company in, in, a, in a bunch of ways, um, uh, in ways we didn't really expect. Um, I mean, uh, first of all, I'd say it's been, it's been mostly positive for the business. Um, I mean, people seem to be reading more and as a, 
book reading company. We seem to be, our numbers seem to be up as a result. Um, you know, like ever since COVID started, our, our conversion rate um, has, has been elevated um, pretty consistently, which shows that there are people who seem to have more interest in reading and the, the reading value prop is stronger than it, than it was pre-COVID. Um, that said, there, the signals are kind of mixed. Um, it was kind of interesting, like right when COVID started, our reading activity shot way up and our audio book activity just cratered. Um, I guess it's because people stopped commuting and that was one of the big mm-hmm. places and people would listen to audiobooks. Uh, but now kind of all the metrics are sort of back up um, across the board. Um, also, it's worth noting at the beginning of COVID, we, um, you know, we did a, a promotion where we, um, we made Scribd available for, um, for free for 30 days without a credit card, just because everyone was at home and, and kind of bored and, and looking for things to do. So we did that promotion and we got a really big growth spike out of that. I mean, it was a big, one of the biggest viral growth spikes we've had. Um, so um, yeah, I think, you know, it's, it's been, it's been, I think, mostly good for the business. Um, and also, uh, um, also had just some kind of some, some unexpected fluctuations. Um, it's also obviously changed the, the culture of the company because, I mean, we've gone to almost entirely remote. Um, I, I, you know, I, I was really worried that what that, that, what that was going to be like, but it's turned out to go pretty well. We've done just fine as a company. I mean, uh, I, I mean, there's definitely benefits of in-person I and mean, we actually have our team uh, together in Carmel this week and we're spending the week together and it's, it's, it's great. Uh, but I think in, in, in general, in the future, I mean, this has definitely changed the way we work with this more remote forward approach and we're, we'll, we'll likely be having some, uh, you know, kind of mixed remote and uh, in-person approach going forward, just because there's kind of pros and cons to both, both ways of working. Yeah, I think, I think you're hitting on a lot of things people are thinking about Trip is, is how do you navigate post this and both just from the, the, co- the worker side of standpoint, as well as how do you approach customers? Uh, Jacob, maybe something for you, for, you, for you to answer, you know, COVID was a pretty big mental stress uh, impact to a lot of people across the globe. And so journaling is, I think, one way people relieve stress. Any thoughts from you just on how people interact with your product either more or less during COVID? And we definitely saw a spike up, especially in terms of just organic people starting to come into journaling as well. Um, I think and the other thing that started happening was, of course, we started focusing much more on organic in general in, in our business um, versus the beginning when we were sort of also focusing a lot on how could we bring in users um, through paid marketing all the time. Um, COVID, yeah. We definitely saw prices increase a lot, right? Which made us focus more on the organic side of stuff because we could just see, you know, while we've been very attractive early on, we could just see it was going towards zero, right? It's people just spending more and more digital marketing all the time. And um, so we really, I think we, COVID's been super good for us in the, in, the, in the process of just making it a really, really organic growth machine that we tried to create. Um, and, and so that's been really positive for us because it was an eye opener. The good thing is it was a balancing, right? So we started spending much less on marketing, but the organic started increasing instead. Mm-hmm. And, and that, so that, it was again a mix for us in terms of, in terms of that. Um, but, but better, more engaged users for sure came out of COVID. Yeah, that's, that's, that's positive. And, and so it sounds like you're continuing to see usage stay strong even, even post COVID as people found- And conversion, yeah, conversion up as well. That's great. Um, maybe shifting away from more current events and into, you know, how do you guys think about running and managing your businesses? We'd love to talk about content, right? You know, a lot of these CSS businesses are, are focused on what do people get in exchange for a subscription? So maybe a question for you, Trip, is, is how do you think about the content that your users want to see? I mean, there's, there's thousands of probably millions of pieces of content on Scrib. How do you guys think about that, that content acquisition strategy? Um, yeah, so we, we do a lot of uh, a lot of work to build out our content library. Um, we started with user generated content. We allow people to just upload PDFs or PowerPoint presentations to the web, and we um, and and we we'd add them to our library that way. Then about five years in, we started um, partnering with uh, with with uh, book publishers to add premium books. Um, mm-hmm. we, we basically went and started partnering with all the book publishers in New York. We we launched the world's first subscription model for for eBooks and started making eBooks available um, in, in our library along with the documents. Um, and we've just been adding more content since. We've added audiobooks, we've added magazines, we've added sheet music, we've added podcasts. Um, and now in this, this latest phase, we're starting to create our own original content. We're working directly with authors um, and creating, uh, creating books or different kinds of written content that are you know, exclusive to the Scrib audience. Um, and you know, we've done some, um, you know, we've done some, some, some big works uh, with um, you know, people like uh, like Margaret Atwood, we just um, did a did a book with her um, a few weeks ago, and um, you know we're signing lots of um, um, lots of big authors, and we're also creating content that kind of appeals to certain niches of users of our in our audience. So you know we have certain like pockets where we'll see really voracious 
uh, you know, audiobook listeners or very voracious readers of a particular type of fiction book. And those kinds mm -hmm. of cases, we can create sort of long tail content to serve those users. Um, so we have all sorts of different ways of creating content, and um, and we, we we you know we, we do what we have to do to get the content to the right user at the right time. It mostly happens through uh, recommendations and machine learning and AI, where we uh, understand the user's uh, taste profile and get them the right content um, for them. Um, we also do have an editorial team. We have a search feature, but I think really like I see the vision as using um, you know machine learning to to kind of figure out how to get the right content to the right people, just because we have so many users and so much content. So connecting them the right way is is is, is ultimately going to be like a, a, a recommendations problem. Yeah, you know, the discovery function on, on, on script is actually quite powerful. It's, it's definitely figured out, it's, you know, I like, I like, you know, science fiction and, and when do I want to read those. So it's been, it's been a really fun way to discover new authors for me. That's not on like the New York times, like top 100 list. Um, well, Taylor, maybe, maybe a question for you on the content side, right? Language learning is a chore sometimes, right? Like you always feel like, oh, do I have to go do homework? You know, so how is Toucan, you know, helping change that, that mentality? Yeah, so if you think of Toucan, we have over 10,000 root words. Uh, the major mobile apps out there have around 3,000. And then we also benefit, it's like a one-two punch of our manual creation of our dictionary per se, but then we use machine learning and natural language processing to pull out the whole context of the page that you're on. So it's really cool. We can use the pages people are browsing as our own content generators to then figure out how far or how easy we push people um, and where they really sit so that it feels more fun and engaging, Eric. And it almost feels like invisible learning. Like you're on Twitter and all of a sudden you see Spanglish on your page and you're really picking up these words without even noticing it, which is amazing too, because it is one of the most efficacious ways to learn this immersion, invisible learning side of it that we are harnessing versus let's try to get someone to sit down for 10 minutes and maybe open this app to do homework um, and get it done. But with five hours a day, people engaging with us, they're encompassing over a thousand words on a daily basis over and over again. Yeah, and I think, I think just to kind of, to move into the next, the next topic, right, which is, which is user actions, right? You know, in order to justify a subscription, either monthly or annually, your consumers, they have to feel like they're getting some value out of it, which means they have to open and use your product. And so, so Taylor, maybe just sticking with you and then we'll go to Jacob, you know, how do you encourage users to use your product to okay. open, open the app? But luckily I think I have an answer. I think I know your answer from Toucan. Yeah. I mean, that's the beautiful aspect of Toucan is like you open your browser and you're browsing and then we're there and they're having these magic moments every single minute as they're on the web and we're front of mind, which then for us, it's actually reflecting that value back to the user, like showing them how much they're progressing, how much they are actually learning. Because as you're seeing it every minute you're browsing, you don't really realize how much you're retaining long-term. And so that has been key for us driving subscriptions and conversion for Toucan is like showing the user, wow, I'm actually learning a ton. And now I can upgrade for some of these deeper engagement exercises, whether that's little quizzes or mini games or ad hoc practices. Yeah, Jacob, how about how about yourself and Reflectly? Like, how do you encourage people to continue to journal? Yeah, you know, like we, we of course try to use and um, a lot of people that are coming, that's probably the, the way I would start it. You know, they're already journalists in the beginning. So they are into it. They already do it. They just need a new place to do it. They want a place to store it. And they want to be able to, so we, we are not a content business, right? We're just a product business. So for us, users create the content and it's up for us to figure out a way, what can we do with the content for them to get as much value out of it as possible. When we started reflecting, right, the, the whole premise of it was that we thought we could get more people into journaling if we turn it into a question-based element instead. Um, and, and that thesis worked out. And now we are trying to essentially give users, you know, some effort to actually do it, but not too much, right? So it's about reducing friction, but still having some sort of feeling that they actually got something out of it. And we try to balance that based on the user that are coming in, whether they're power users, whether they're into journaling normally or, or not. And we also do a bunch of other things. Some days they just do challenges in there. They just look at the old content, right? So memories in there, all these types of things. So I think for us, it, it, it's based on behavior, how we attack that. And some people really need gamified, other people are just at it from the very get-go. 
on the gamification, do you offer, you know, rewards, badges, you know, when I go hiking on all trails, right, and I, I complete a new hike, I get a verified complete badge. Like, how do you guys think about that from the journaling standpoint? Well, a lot of the, it's also just from stats, right? So if you actually, for example, a lot of us, um, especially in the beginning, they use us as a mood tracking element. So they go in and track the mood over time. They want to see, and that's gamified as well, right? Because they want to improve the the mood over time and then they use reflectly to sort of be the coach to actually enable to do that or definitely the place where they reflect whether or not they actually are in a better place than they were before and mm. um, so yeah it, it, it with journaling you're getting so many different types of use cases as well and which is also sometimes a tough part about building a product like this you have to cater to many different types of use cases and um, and that's also what we try to do we we're seeing great results with audio journaling these types of things as well and um, because some people also just prefer that so we are just trying all the time to reduce friction to getting as much out of journaling as possible. But journaling does require something of you. So like that, that's the balance, right? Because you also get a lot of value from actually sitting down and, and really going through it. But you also want it to be super simple, super, uh, super fast, and just a very, very enjoyable experience in a short period of time as well. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's interesting around different use cases. Trip, maybe a question for you, right? You mentioned that your type of content is not just uh, reading, right? It's music sheets, it's audiobooks. So people are engaging with Scribd in a variety of different ways. You know, how, how have you thought about customizing the user experience for engaging with Scribd in a variety of different manners and with different types of content? Like you're muted, Trip, by the way. I'm mute here, got it. Um, I, think, uh, I think it's, uh, it's, 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 it's a tricky problem for us. Uh, I mean, I think we have, uh, a broader set of use cases than than a lot of companies. Um, just given that we, we we start out with user generated content, there's just so many different types of user generated content, and then we added more different types of premium content. So there's just a lot of different use cases. So um, in general, I mean, we just built it as a as a platform that can kind of um, uh, that can kind of handle multiple types of content. And when users come in, we can kind of, um, as I said, just use ML and and machine learning to and, and AI to kind of figure out what what that user that what that user wants. Um, so that's the main way we do it. Um, I think, you know, I think there's another problem we're working on going forward is just, you know, identifying um, like, you know, of all these users we have, what is like kind of the, the, the main group or groups you want to fo focus on and, and build the right experience for them. Um, but I think, yeah, if we, if we pick, if we pick uh, kind of a, a, a certain target demographic that kind of has, is, is, you know, it's kind of like the core group we want to go after that will sort of then um, uh, have a kind of a spillover effect and sort of, bring the other groups along with it. Um, but I'd say, yeah, it's, a, it's a definitely one of the challenges we have and it makes it just a more challenging part of running the business. No, no I think that's, it's a really tough problem to solve, but once, once you hit it, right, it can build really fantastic businesses. Mm -hmm. um, maybe just want to double click on something Taylor said on, on user action. And I think both Trip and Jacob, you know, built their original business on, you know, iOS and Android apps, right? So it's a little more of an app ecosystem. Taylor's done something pretty unique with Toucan where they built a uh, focus for the browser first. And so uh, in our updating research report that's coming out for 2021, we talk about browser-based businesses and, and people don't really think about them too much, but they're becoming huge. And so like Speechify, Grammarly are all going to be phenomenal businesses. And we'd love to hear Taylor just why you chose building on a browser-based first first to going app direct. Yeah. So us co-founders, our entire careers have been building mobile apps. And we were some of the earliest employees at Headspace, like an amazing meditation app. Um, so we learned firsthand how hard it was to steal time out of people's very busy days. <laughs> but then not only that, when we started looking at the browser ecosystem, we're like this is a huge distribution channel that's completely overlooked and untapped. And it's worth us at least trying our MVP out over here on Chrome and see what happens. And that's one of the reasons why too, I think we proved out our thesis of meeting people where they are is huge from a retention perspective. Like we really do have world-class retention um, as well as engagement. Like that five hours a day is pretty much unheard of in the mobile app world, even with TikTok, maybe an hour a day. And so with those two, we like doubled down on it. And now that's really our thesis layering on top of existing behaviors mobile browser, I mean, um, web-based browsers, but now also Apple announced mobile browsing um, for extensions, which is mm -hmm. huge. And I think we're just gonna see more and more developers come here. And even with the Honey acquisition, $4 billion and Grammarly, another unicorn and many others coming out and building huge businesses off of it. 
Yeah, I think and one one question for you, Taylor. Right, we've talked a little bit about how Apple's, you know, a, you know, it's a partner and sometimes a protagonist or a, a potential uh, conflict with some of these iOS businesses. How do you think about some of the browser-based companies as partners? Yeah, um, they're all looking at ways to differentiate from each other. And unlike building for a mobile app where maybe you have iOS and Android, we're supporting six different browsers right now. And they're all competing for market share. And they're mm -hmm. all looking at extensions as a way to differentiate from each other. And so they're really leaning into their dev ecosystem and seeing how can we support you, which usually it's the other way around when you're a mobile app developer. You're begging Apple to try to help you. Um, but we're seeing a lot of resources from these big companies because they really see a lot of value and um, their own users becoming attached to extensions and really wanting them as they browse. Yep. No, I think, I think that's a really good viewpoint uh, and kudos for those companies to, to kind of lean in to supporting their, their ecosystem. Uh, and you, you highlighted a, a key piece, which I think a lot of us in the CSS world think about, which is user retention, Taylor. So maybe maybe since uh, I'm, we're talking, we're chatting with you real quick, then we'll go to, to Trip and Jacob. How, how do you think about retention? You know, what, what are kind of some of the, the levers that you've built to encourage retention? Yeah. So as an early stage company, no one wants a leaky bucket. So retention was the number one metric we always had a high, uh, an eye on. And so we wanted to make sure we were at a really great retention rate before we started scaling. And we still have our, our, our eye on it. But being in the browser, it's really, and users deriving value from us every single day, it's hard to in, uninstall us. But on the flip side, since we're with people so much, we have to make sure um, we only lean in when they ask us to lean in. Um, mm -hmm. Otherwise, we might be like uh, a new day clippy, like, hey, pay attention to us, like over here, do this instead, when actually no users just want to browse about their day and be able to lean in if they want to or lean out if they want to do that too. And that's totally okay with us, but that's something we have to be really mindful of as well as building in user controls on how to customize their experience. Maybe they don't want to can working on Gmail. And we actually, um, based off of user feedback, we don't even work on Gmail anymore. You can't activate us. Same with financial um, bank accounts. Like we technically <laughs> could work on bankofamerica.com, but we choose not to. Um, just from like a user perspective and a retention aspect too. And just keeping those pieces in mind when we're building our product. That's that's really interesting. Yeah, I think I'd probably stress out a little bit if I was on Chase and saw all my my buttons turn into Japanese. I think that would cause me quite a lot of heartburn. Right. Uh, trip, trip. Maybe just the same question to you. You know, you guys, I think, offer both monthly and annual subscriptions. How do you guys think about retention of your users when there's so many other ways to to buy content these days? Yeah. So retention retention is a really important metric, and it's um it's also a, it's a kind of a tricky metric because just so many inputs that go into that number. Um, we basically have, uh, three drivers of retention. Um, the, the three that we, that we, we focus on. So the first is engagement. Um, we find that if users engage more, they are more likely to retain. So we've kind of identified the key metrics that will indicate, um, uh, uh the key engagement metrics that, that are going to be correlated with retention. And then we have, um, you know, various teams kind of go after, um, improving those engagement met metrics and that drives up retention over time. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing is um, a lot of retention is done just kind of on the, the payment side of things and making sure we can we can process payments. Um, so we have a payments team that that works on that. Um, and you know, a lot of that happens in, in other countries where just the, the payment options become a little bit, um, um, you know, a little, little bit different from the US and just there's stuff we have to learn there. Um, so, um, you know, in other countries, a lot about pricing and getting the right payment methods in place. Um, and then the third way we drive retention is, is a little bit unique for us. Um, we actually, uh, we have quite a few users who will will cancel and then come back over time. We have like an on off subscription behavior. Um, you know, people will you know they'll, they'll spend a summer reading a lot, then they won't mm -hmm. want to read for a few months, then they'll want to get back on and read more. Um, and we've kind of just decided to like embrace that behavior. We allow people to cancel easily. We allow them to come back easily. Um, and if they come back, we consider that to be a retention event. So we we work hard to get people who are former members to come back. Um, so all three of those methods we we work on, and they bring retention up. Um, you know, retention is not a number that moves very quickly. It moves very, very slowly. So we, we basically set the goal of just kind of chipping away at retention year over year and, and having each year make a nice steady improvement on retention. Um, and you know, over time that combined with growing the top of your funnel really helps the overall subscriber base grow quite a bit. 
Yeah, before we go to Jacob, one, one just double click on one of those things you mentioned there, Trip, is, is a lot of my customers or clients, they have issues when customers churn and then they come back, right? So is that a new user or is that a, a retained user? How, how do you guys measure that? You know, are you guys using specific systems to track emails, logins? How do you guys think about that? Yeah, we, we just track um, if, a, if a, it's a user's second time signing up, we just are, are aware of that. And, um, and we would count that as like a first user who's been a member for a while, but took a break from subscribing. Um, mm -hmm. I th that, that's how we do it. I think we're a little bit like unique in doing it that way. Um, I haven't heard many other companies think about it that way, but we needed some way to, to, to kind of think about these folks um, who, who churn and come back. Um, and if you're treating them, I mean, we have some people who churn and come back like every other month for like years. And if you count those all as like new sign up and low churn users, like that, I don't think that really reflects like the, you know, what's really going on with that particular user. I think they're more of just the user who's been around for a long time, but likes to pause a lot. So, um, so that's how we think about it. And um, uh, yeah, I, I, we, we have kind of a unique approach for that. Um, but it is def it's definitely a big lever for us is taking these huge number of people who were members and getting them to come back. It's easier to get them to come back than to go find someone brand new. So it's definitely a big lever and, and something that we, you know, make sure we keep our eye on. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I mean, we've, I've, I've done and worked a lot with the businesses that are in the outdoor space and outdoor use is just episodic, right? You use it a lot in the summer, then you go away for the winter. So there's, there's a natural churn point. But when you try to understand the true LTV of these CSS businesses, right, you have to take that into account that some of this usage is episodic. It's not a SaaS product you're using in a day-to-day -day working environment, right? Where you're showing up, you know, 200 days plus a year and using it. It's something you're doing in your spare time to support a passion. And that passion maybe not happening every day, unless you're Taylor and her business where you're always using Google Chrome or a browser once a day. Um, so Jacob, maybe, maybe kind of going back to just the, the core retention piece, how, how do you guys think about retention at, at Reflectly? Um, that's like actually a great question. It's something that has also been changing all along. You know, when we started the product, we wanted to be an, an everyday product. You know, we were so focused on getting people to journal every day. We tried to reduce friction to get people to, to journal every day. And I think in that process, we realized that journaling is not something you might not do every day. Um, it might be something you do from time to time. And sometimes you might do it very intensively and sometimes you might not as much. So we try to cater again to multiple use cases. There is some people that just want to journal every day. They just want, you know, they have these streaks. They just want to do the every day of the year so they can mm -hmm. look at everything. And, and, um, and then there are some things, right, where it's just, it, it intensified during periods. They stop for a couple of months and they also come back again. Uh, we still try to get people. So our hook is, of course, that um, in terms of getting retention, there is that, that you can still do stuff if it's not actually journaling, going back to look at memories, doing some other stuff. We also have some types of content in there, although it's more lower key content today. Mm -hmm. So we try again, you know, we, we think different about um, retention today versus that what, what we did in the beginning. And we look at it over a longer period of time. And then if we go into the more nitty gritty, it's also for us to find the right intent for users. You know, if you come in and you're not really into doing it, it's just really tough, right? Because we do ask a lot for you. And so it is about finding the right users that it really needs and whether it really is a problem they're, they're trying to solve. And so I think it's also from a marketing, you know, like it, it, we can just see that, right? We've changed retention massively when we actually find the right audience for our app as well. And instead of just trying to push pe people through TikTok and other places, it can be super tough. But if you get the right users, right, and, and you have a nice product for them, you, and you tend to have really long-term users as well because they build up their own content, right? So it also becomes very, it, it, yeah, you know, like the ones that then really start, those are, you know, incredible good users. But it's, so it's about finding the right users as well. Yeah, I think you bring up a good point, Jacob, which is, is effectively turning the consumer's content or the user-generated content that they created into a better product for them to review, which is pulling up memories from the past or... If I'm on Strava, I can see all the old runs I've done over the last year. And that's, that's actually quite a lot of fun for me. And it, you know, I'm giving my, my CSS businesses content that they almost sell back to me. So I think you guys are thinking yeah. about it in a really interesting way. Um, Trip, Trip and Jacob, you guys both mentioned an interesting piece around retention, which is KPIs you guys measure to gauge what retention of a user will be, right? To estimate if you, if you have someone signs up for an annual subscription, Right, you have 12 months before you have any idea if this individual will, ret will retain or resubscribe. What are, what are some of maybe one or two metrics you guys are watching uh, to get an idea of like or estimate that retention number? Maybe Jacob, that I, you can answer that one first. Yeah, I think today we, we do quite know based on you know like within two or three months whether how active how active they are whether or not they are going to become a, a paying subscribers or not. I would say 
we, we definitely see that it tends to follow a line, you know, when, when it's a drop off and when do they use it, we definitely need a monthly engagement. Otherwise, you know, we know that they're lost essentially. Um, so we do know it quite fast, I would say, in, in, in the iteration cycle, whether or not, you know, there'll be improved retention or not, which, of course, can be the, the difficult thing. If you want to only look at the paid retention, you, of course, have to wait, but we look at it from an engagement standpoint, and, and then it also plays out in the, in the, in the paid retention as well. Yeah, Trip, maybe same question for you. What are, what are some of maybe the KPIs, either engagement, usage, logins, content read that you guys look to estimate retention? Yeah, the... Um... The, the main thing that we find correlates with retention is people um, reading in the product. Um, and we, we figured out if uh, someone reads for uh, 10 minutes or more in the first week, they're going to be likely to, uh, likely to retain. So, um, uh, I mean, of course, they read even more, like an hour or more, they're even more likely to retain. But we found that getting, getting users to, once they sign up, read for 10 minutes or more, that's a pretty good, uh, pretty good step and gets them to then become a high retain user. Um, so that's the main leading indicator of retention metric that we use. Um, and uh, um, I, I get the other thing I'd say is, um, you know, we, we've also learned that when we're doing um, A/B tests, um, it, you know, sometimes we, like it takes a while to see the, the retention results of, of an A/B test. Just get to wait a few months. Uh, but we've learned that we can look at like the basically the cancellations in the first few days after sign up, and that becomes a pretty good predictor of how good the retention is going to be in a particular um, A/B test. So we can also look at. Yeah, the basically cancellations in the first first few days after sign up, but that gives us a pretty good sense of how long that user is going to retain. That's that's interesting. It's fascinating that you can get a signal from just ten minutes of reading in the first week. Um, that, that's yeah. that's really neat. And we we've seen it a lot with a lot of our clients. The the auto subscribe on Android or Apple are really good indications of hey, are people just being tourists and checking something out, or are they really subscribing because they found some passion about a specific product? which is a, it's, it's a really great signal for you guys as far as how do I get this person to become more of a local versus a tourist to use the app uh, as much as possible. Um, maybe a question for all three of you guys, uh, just kind of on the last piece of around retention is, is um, a lot of concerns around the CSS sector are consumer uh, fatigue. Do people feel like they're subscribing to 20 things, they get you know, charged to their credit card you know, or their iOS bill every, every month. How do you guys think about uh, subscription fatigue on the consumer space? For your for your users, Jacob, do you want to take it first? Yeah, I'm 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 all on board with that one, right? And um, and I think that that could potentially become a problem. I think um, over time we'll probably see that you know we we're gonna partner together with a bunch of others and create different types of bundles. That that's where I think it's gonna go over time, where you just get access to a, to a bunch more for the for the price, and then maybe with some sort of way of distributing based on the type of use. And it's all interesting right now, you know, so we did set up some, um, some funds in the background to, to acquire certain things that we thought uh, went very well uh, together with uh, Reflecting. And we've seen some great results in offering multiple things for people, right? So they, they subscribe to five or six apps instead of just one. Uh, it's still early days, so, but we are always trying, of course, to innovate uh, around the business model and figure out a way um, to, yeah, to just provide users much more value, um, both perceived and also actual. And um, so, so I would say that's something that we're really looking at that I think will, and we also in chat with other health apps as well to potentially partner and give access to, to both of them through web. And um, so I think that's something that we're going to see more and more, and it's going to be more and more important over time. And um, as users, just as something like a bit more like a healthcare element for them, for us. It's just something they subscribe to and then they use whatever they feel like, whenever they feel like it, but it's just available for them. And that's definitely behavior that we are starting to to tap into. Yeah, Taylor, maybe same question to you. How do you think about consumer fatigue? Yeah, I think there may be fatigue on the consumer end, but also I think that they're so much more used to subscriptions now and they feel empowered and know how to unsubscribe if they don't want to, that I'm actually interested and curious to see like a swing back to the power of the companies where I think it was Netflix that Obviously, people use their Netflix subscription, but they were being as bold to say, if you're not using this subscription, we're actually going to unsubscribe you and mm -hmm. automatically do that because we know we're going to deliver so much value to you. Um, otherwise, why pay? And so I actually think the onus is on the company to proving that value to users because they're still subscribing left and right. How many streaming services are we subscribed to right now? Probably way too many. But if you're getting value from that company, then I think we're still seeing, um, at least on Toucan's end too, high propensity then to subscribe. 
Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I love the statement, like if you're still getting value. And I think that's fundamentally true. Consumers are smart, right? And, and they have to be, it's easy to unsubscribe to services they don't like these days. So I think that makes a lot of sense. And then just a quick trip. Do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, no, I agree with what Tyler and Jacob said, but, um, but yeah, I, I definitely think um, subscription fatigue is, is going to become a problem. You know, I mean, originally subscriptions existed, so you didn't have to buy a bunch of things a la carte. Um, and now like subscriptions are kind of becoming the new a la carte because there's so many subscriptions. So I think the future is, uh, the, is basically bundles where, you know, uh, subscriptions will bundle together and then you can get multiple subscriptions for, for, for just for one subscription. Um, we're actually pursuing that, that strategy uh, with, our, with our company. So um, with your Scrib membership, we have a number of, of partners. So with Scrib, you get for free, you get access to TuneIn Premium, you get access to Movie, you get access to Curiosity Stream, you get access to Peak. Um, you know, we have a uh, uh, number of partners that you get for free with your membership and we're still mm -hmm. adding more partners and, and, and that way your script membership becomes more valuable and we get a, a retention bump by having these, these partners in the product. Um, and then they get basically free, uh, free users that come over from script. Um, so we're building this out and, and, um, you know, we're, we're happy to, uh, bundle other subscriptions into script or, or vice versa. You know, we're very pro bundling. So we've also. Um, exploring deals where like we would be bundled into other services to get to get growth there. So um, I think it's a really interesting strategy and, and it's kind of where bundling is going to go. So um, yeah, if uh, Taylor or Jacob, if you guys want to explore a, a bundling deal, let us know. I Trip, I don't it. think this, this, this is a very, that's a very selfish play, but I really respect the, the ass. No, I'm kidding. That's uh, Jacob, anything you want to add to that? Or are you just going to say yes yeah, to no, I just, right now? Yeah, yeah I, would, I would just say, uh, first of all, yes, but, but I would also just agree <laughs> agree on this. I think what we are looking for is win-wins, right? You know, so we're, you know, also from a business model, how do you actually make things better as, as businesses as well and focus on what you really do well, right? Just building products and then figure out a way to just have a better distribution through other people as well. So I think it can be win-win for when, when I think it's successful is because it's a win-win, right? It's both good for consumers. They get much more value and it's also better for companies as well, because it's just a better business model. If you, if you think about it. And we also like a lot of the things that we look at today, we look at it from a media perspective, simply because we don't want to be, um, be in Facebook and these types of things. So like, I think that's early. I would say it's very early, but I think in one or two years, I think we're all going to be in bundles, whether or not we like it or not. And just because consumers like it, you know, I would actually, I would say Netflix is a bundle, right? You know, like if you look at all the content that's in there, that's a bundle as well. Do you watch every single piece of Netflix episode? No, you don't, right? But you just like the fact that you have access to it whenever you actually want to watch it. Um, and I subscribe to Netflix, I barely watch it, right? But it's just like, if I want to on Friday night at some point, then, you know, I'm actually going to do it. And um, so, so I think I, I would consider Netflix a bundle business today, the way I look at it. And Eric, just a small touch, just on this theme, we also are exploring bundles too at Toucan. Like we're talking to every major language learning player out there and how do we bundle Toucan with them? So I definitely think that this is a theme happening out in the ecosystem. All right, so I think we have a deal there between, between Trip Taylor and Jacob. So that we, I'll let you guys just handle that offline. Uh, but I think that's, I think I agree with all three of you. Um, we're seeing it in, in a ton of different categories, mental health, you're seeing it a lot in outdoor, and then you're seeing it a ton in fitness, right? Everyone is trying to say like, how do you become the all-in-one solution to people? So they need one, one bundle. And I think it'll be interesting because there's going to be bundles, but then there's going to be uh, point solutions for special, uh, very specific needs. And so uh, how this evolves is going to be really fascinating to watch how it plays out over the next uh, year or two. So I know, I know we've only got 10 minutes left, but, and I want to just touch on a couple of things real quick, just on the funding environment. And then I want to hear from you guys, you know, what's your favorite CSS business? If you look at what you subscribe to, you know, what, what do you just, what can you never turn from? Um, but maybe just quick on the funding side, uh, obviously M&A and capital raise markets are extremely robust right now. So, so knock on wood, I think hopefully they continue for a little bit. Um, but so maybe Taylor, I'd love to start with you. I know you guys recently did a small round. Would love to hear just your view on the investor appetite for CSS businesses these days. Yeah, it's very strong. Um, I'm hit up all day, every day. A lot of inbound emails. <laughs> it's great. It's a great testament to Toucan. It's also very humbling. Um, but there's a lot of capital out there and a lot of appetite for subscription-based businesses. And I think one of the best things about it is that the revenue can be predictable and investors can model out, okay, where, where does this go based off of the data that we have? and that we can show too. 
Yeah, I, I, I would, I'll second that, Taylor. I know I, I asked to invest in Toucan personally, so I'm a big fan of the big fan of the product. So, so kudos on on that interest. Um, you know, trip maybe on the other end, right? A lot of people are considering like, what do these CSS businesses look like when they grow up? Do they become like SaaS businesses and go public? Do they get bought by private equity? Do they stay private? Any thoughts from you, Trip? And no, you might have a few things planned for Scrib personally, so you don't have to comment on Scrib specifically if you don't want to. I think um, subscription businesses uh, make great later stage companies and great public companies. Um, I mean, if you look at some of the recent IPOs, um, there's companies like Duolingo or Bumble, which are basically large subscription services, and they're uh, getting huge, uh, I mean, huge market caps, like 20x multiples off of revenue. Uh, so I think it just shows you investors are um, really excited about subscription services. And then, of course, you have like the, the big ones like Netflix and Spotify, which are worth $50, $100 billion plus. And then, um, and then you also ones like, like, like the New York Times. I mean, they're, they're a subscription media service now worth about $10 billion. Um, so, I mean, there, there's just, there, it just shows there's a lot of room to build subscription services at scale that have them be publicly traded companies. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, I, I think you could really, like the investors are clearly really interested. Um, I think investors don't, they still don't quite understand subscription. Um, I think, um, you know, investors are often like these days, they're just looking for hyper growth. That's sort of the thing they're focused on. And what's unique about subscription is like, it, subscription businesses usually don't grow quite as fast as like, a social network, for example. Um, but what they do though, is they, they maintain very steady growth for many years in a row. Um, so I think like with subscriptions, even if, if, you're, if, you're, if your growth looks slower this year than some other business, there's, there's a good chance you're likely to sustain that growth rate for many, many years into the future. I don't think investors fully take that into account when they invest. And that's, and that's why they you know, missed out so much on businesses like Netflix, right? Uh, I think most people just weren't able to foresee that Netflix was gonna just keep growing its subscribers steadily year over year over year for so many years. Um, so I think that's one way, so I think investors, they are really interested in subscriptions at the, at the later stages, but they still aren't quite appreciating them as much as they could. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point, Trip, because a lot of people I think view CSS businesses as niche. Like, oh, it's a, you know language learning. Like, obviously that's a global use case, but who is gonna use it in one thing or the other or mountain biking or you know hiking? And then for you guys, it's reading, right? But then you go into podcasts and you go into music. And so you can expand your niches or start to move into new ones. And your TAM just starts growing every time you add a new, a new, a new content uh, to your platform. Yeah, no, that's, that's well said. Yeah, I think it, investors, uh, they seem to commonly think of subscription businesses, niche businesses, where it's like people are paying for a service that's that, who are the power users of that particular idea. But these, they seem to get much bigger than that. Um, because they, they do start attracting casual readers, they are casual users, they expand globally, um, and, and, and subscription services can expand other types of content and businesses. So um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's true. They're, they're, gonna, they're, they're going far beyond on niche. And I think that's a, yeah, that's a common misconception, I think. Yeah, I think, and Bumble's a great example of that, right? If you think about Bumble, it's, it's best users, the ones that are most successful on Bumble should be leaving Bumble. Right. So they're naturally unsubscribing to a product if they're successful. But what Bumble's done is they've expanded past just dating. Right. Now it's you can find friends, there's networking through it. So they're they're really trying to make that subscription valuable longer than just a natural short-term use case. So Jacob, maybe a question for you is, you know, you guys are thinking about, you know, growth through through doing some some acquisitions or adding new new pieces on there. How's the investor funding environment for, you know, like let's just call it acquisition or MA? Um, definitely good, you know, so I think in general, there is, I think people are starting to realize that niches are becoming bigger as well, right? and you can get really far with a small team in, um, in consumer subscription as well, due to the fact that it's just like, and I've seen some crazy ones, right, so, so not just us, but, but also a lot of other people, and, and I think it, I still think it's super early, that's the way, I, that's also what I always say, I think in, in terms of the business model, I think we're not sophisticated at all. I think Apple, of course, launched this thing here in the beginning in 2016, 17, right? And suddenly, and it's also just looking at the environment from when we started back in 2017, nobody really believed that anybody would subscribe to a journal app, right? And today we have more than 200,000 paying users. And, and I think we have a very small team and not raised a lot of money. And, and that goes to show the power of the model as well, especially if it takes 12 months up front, it's essentially funding you, yep. right? So... Like you're essentially getting your own funding if you actually if you have steady cohorts right and you actually just bring on new people all the time you get 12 months up front 
um, then you know you, you suddenly are funding yourself in, in many ways as well. Um, so I think you, you need to be smart about what you what you take in and and what kind of money you actually spend as well. Um, but in general, I would say there is we, we've never seen more interest than what we're seeing right now, um, definitely over the last year. Or so, um, but we are mostly focused on just them. Um, and just building, you know, the business better, building the products better, and and building the team better, and then and then because we essentially, you know, we are running a cash flow positive business today, and if we suddenly can see we could spend much more money, we do it right. Um, but I think that's becomes the problem with these; they become very liquid very early on. Um, if you, if you actually get to some sort of scale, and so um, so yeah, we are we're definitely looking to capital. There is a lot of it. Um, out there, there's also once you get, get, you know, uh, you can also put depth on it, right? There's something that we're attractive. So uh, then we suddenly get offers from uh, as well now. And, and so there's a bunch of ways, right? So we also try to become more sophisticated in, in how we look at it. But we are, we are always interested in partnering with great people. Yeah, no, I think well said. Uh, well, I know we've got five minutes left and you guys are extremely busy CEOs. So last two questions for each of you. Um, if you had one CSS uh, app or service that you subscribe to now, you know, what is the one thing you can't give up? And then the second one, if you had to invest in a CSS business, either public, private, uh, where where would you put, be putting your bets for the next big next big players in the space? Um, let's see, Taylor, do you want to go first on the CSS business you can't live without, and then the one you'd love to invest in? Yeah, um, and I can want to punch it too. My two are Grammarly and Headspace. Headspace, I'm very biased, but I also think there's huge things coming, especially with their recent merger. And on the Grammarly side, I can't live without it. it saves me so much on misspelling. <laughs> and also a fellow browser extension. Yeah. As a fellow terrible speller, uh, I would have to agree with you on Grammarly. It's probably saved me from multiple embarrassing moments. Uh, right. Jacob, how about, do you want to go next? I think for me right now, it'd be Strava, just because I'm trying to really get into better, better shape and fiber. So I'm, I'm living abroad at this point. So, and I'm still trying to, to compete with friends back home. Um, and also just seeing my own progress there. And then I think, the, the, the fact they managed to layer the social aspect on top of what they're doing there, I think it's a very, very powerful. It gives them a network effect as well. And so I, I think that business is underrated. That would be my Yeah, be my I'd say uh, Strava, I've talked to Michael multiple times. They're building something really phenomenal around community and not just yeah. you know tracking your own self and, and, and kind of seeing how fast you ran, right? They're doing some really fun, fantastic stuff there to add some value to the subscription. And yeah, something we're trying to do as well. So So... So that's uh, that's also why you know we are we are looking at, at us as well to build some sort of social aspect on top as well in, in 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 what we do. But it needs to be right, right? That's the problem. We've we've had a lot of things in beta where we actually shut it down again because it is a tough thing. It's a very personal environment that we build as well. And yeah. I think it's easier for Strava to put like that than versus us. But I think it could still be powerful, powerful in, in our place. Yeah, and then trip. Uh, not last but not least, uh, the CSS business you can't live without, and then the one you'd invest in today. Yeah, I'd say think about the one I use the most, and um, the answer is kind of conventional. It's Spotify. Uh, just Spotify is really, really good one um, uh, for all the obvious reasons. I started thinking of one that's a little more niche, though, and uh, I, that you mentioned earlier. It's a, it's a really good one. All Trails. Um, I think it's it, and I like it's a good example of a subscription service that I mean, who, who would have thought you could build a you know a subscription company around a hiking trails, right? And they're doing really well. And it's a it's a great app and just a great example of a of a subscription service that's that seems niche but it's actually getting really big um and in terms of what i would invest in um i mean i basically have invested in all of the subscription companies that are 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 public like the ones we've mentioned like um you know duolingo bumble new york times netflix spotify and they've all they've all done well um they all just kind of keep keep uh keep going up and i think they're all i think what's gonna happen with all of them is they're gonna just keep announcing new subscriber records every single year and and then wall street's gonna go like wow they they're growing even more and then their stock price is gonna go up because i think that i think the future growth is still probably not priced into their current prices so uh so i think just i yeah i, I like investing in in all these in all these descriptions um and i think they'll do well over time yeah i think i don't think gp bohan disagrees with you at all i think we've uh we have a css index we track pretty closely um and you've seen some really nice growth there um and it's, it's one of those that's not completely uh, overvalued, right? We've seen some crazy multiples on B2B SaaS businesses, uh, and a lot of them deserve them. But I think on the CSS side, that, that recognition from Wall Street's coming. Uh, well, I know it's, it's almost the top of the hour, guys. So I just want to say thank you to all our panelists. It's been an absolute pleasure just to have the chance to chat with you guys. 
I know a lot of people I've already gotten a ton of notes learned a lot um, over this panel. And so I would encourage um, anyone who's listening in, don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, my email's on the website. You also could follow GPB on Twitter as well as uh, Taylor, Tripp and Jacob will have all their information available. And then uh, finally, as you can see from the last slide here, our 2021 consumer subscription software report is now available live on the web. Uh, it's free, take a look, tell me, what you, tell me what we got wrong. I, you know, compliments are great, but I love criticism. So don't hesitate to, to tell us where we can improve. But with that, I'll, uh, I'll turn it over and let everyone get back to their really busy days. But thanks everyone for being here. That's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. Have a good day, everybody. Bye.